First reading, a reading from Genesis, the fourth chapter. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must not rule over it. But you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, Why, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Lord, behold, you have driven be today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Second reading, a reading from the first Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I will deliver to you as first as of the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I have persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. 
On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though I was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. O Lord, have mercy upon us. I fast twice a week, 
I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. By the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, we are bold to confess. I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered the conscious power, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of Jesus. The communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the Father, and the life everlasting.
only in the Easter season, but also in the season of Trinity. The reason that we say Christ is risen and not Christ has risen is because he is alive. He is still alive in his perpetual resurrected state, in the state of being risen, being resurrected, glorified, alive. He is the one that comes soon, who has the keys to death and hell, the one beheld by John in Revelation, the one who comes to judge the living and the dead. He is alive, and we are alive in him. He was promised by the Almighty when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Genesis 3.15, the first promise of the gospel, the descendant of a woman would crush the head of the serpent. There's a number of things that are confusing about Bible translation and different manuscripts of the Bible from of old. One of the interesting points that often gets missed in attempts to render this in English, because God had promised the descendant of a woman would crush the serpent's head, Eve gives birth to her firstborn son, saying, I have gotten a man, the Lord. I have gotten a man who is the Lord. She believed the promise of God, and she thinks that Cain is the Messiah. And why not? Nothing else had ever happened like Cain. She suddenly became pregnant. She carried a baby. She gave birth. Adam and Eve were made out of dirt. Life was blown into them, the Almighty Spirit of God making them alive. Nothing ever had happened like Cain. She believes the promise of God, and she believes that God will fulfill it. Despite their rebellion in the garden, we know that Adam and Eve are believers in God now. They are driven to repentance by His Spirit. They believe the promise that He promised, and they think the time is now. The problem is Cain is not the Messiah, being their firstborn offspring in this natural way that God created. What he is is the proof that their curse of sin brought upon humanity before his birth is passed on. Yes, this is known, and God had said this would perpetually be the curse of the fall. But what they see, they see manifest in Cain, that instead of being the Messiah, he is the opposite. He is the proof that the curse is passed on. He grows up to be a murderer, a murderer of his own brother. This is the nature of the curse of sin, that it divides us one against another. It makes us selfish in a way that we were not capable of being in perfection, both because of our sinlessness and the perfection of the cosmos in which we found ourselves. Now, because of the curse of the sin, Cain can grow up to be a murderer of his own brother, and people will fight over the last remnants and scraps of food as the ground struggles to bring forth the abundance it used to have. This too was part of the curse. God told Adam, by the sweat of your brow will you get bread from the earth. You'll have to work for it, not walking around a perfect garden and grabbing the fruit that God had offered for eternal life and eternal, eternal, I hate it when I forget the word I was going to use. Now you have to work for it, and now you have to invent this thing we call agriculture. You've got to work the land and plow the soil and fertilize it and make sure that it gets plenty of water and pray for rain. The fall means scarcity. It means division. It means man against man, humanity turning on one another over what is left over, and jealousy and envy and spite. All of the things that drive us to violence, all of the things that drive us to division, and hatred, all the way down to our friend in the temple, the Pharisee, and the tax collector behind him. The per per in perpetuity, the sinfulness of humanity passed on. The same thing that made Cain jealous of Abel, even unto murder. The thing that makes the Pharisee mock his brother right in the temple, in the house of God. His brother by faith, by confession, by nation. In every respect, his brother but he despises him and considers himself superior. This is the curse of sin to which we still have the promise. It may be, yes indeed, that Eve thought Cain was the Messiah and was wrong, but now we live in a time when the firstborn son has been brought forth. The metaphor has continued since Cain was born. 
despite what he did when he grew up, we get all of these great births of great patriarchs and figures that lead to the one nativity, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ into the flesh. We get the deliverance of Moses, who has floated down the river and assigned both of the flood before him and the baptism yet to come, who will lead the people of God, God's children being born again out of Egypt, reborn, washed in baptism in the Red Sea, and in a million other ways down through the ages, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, manifest, working for our good in our lives, for our redemption, and yet, most of the time, the appearances of Jesus are under the signs and symbols of things. Jesus appears to us in our own brothers and sisters, in the people of the world, in all of the opportunities we have to do good to others. Virtuous, real good, the way that God defines it, according to the sharing of genuine love and truth. He appears to the disciples of Israel, in the cloud and the fire, in the manna from heaven, the burning bush, he appears to Moses. He gives them water from the rock. He comes to us in his word. He comes to us in the waters of baptism. He comes to us with his own body and blood under the symbols of bread and wine. But much more than that, it all points to a time of the completion of the promise. Yes, the promise that the one who will crush the head of the serpent has been fulfilled. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and by his glorious incarnation, his life, his atonement on the cross, and his glorious resurrection, he has cast out the power of the evil one. But our final deliverance waits when, like those mentioned by Paul in the epistle, we behold the resurrected Jesus. He manifests, yes, in all of these various ways in our life of faith and in the world, but we have not seen him face to face the way Mary Magdalene saw him alive at the tomb. We have not seen him the way that Paul saw him on the road to Damascus, or the way that Peter saw him just outside Rome during the persecution, but we will. The, the mother has brought forth the firstborn son, the one who was born to crush the head of the serpent, who is Jesus, and he has undone the curse of sin by his cross and resurrection, but still the one who is alive, who does hold the keys of death and hell, the one who is coming, will appear to us on our own road to Damascus. Whether that is long after we have been buried and we rise to the glorious resurrection that is coming, or whether he appears while we are still living in this world, trapped in time and space. Either way, we will behold him in his glory, like Paul did, and Peter did, and Mary Magdalene, and all the disciples, and the 500 who witnessed the risen Christ ascend into heaven, we will see him in person, not behind the veils of water and bread and wine, our neighbor and other manifestations in the world. Then we will behold him at his coming. As he comes for us, we will be as ones untimely born. Last of all, he will appear to us at that glorious resurrection of the dead, the final triumph and the final undoing of the curse begun in the garden, making all things new, making all things whole, making all things perfect. Because Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Alleluia.
on earth and all the hosts of heaven, we ascribe to you honor and blessing, thanksgiving and praise. Holy and magnificent are you, heaven and earth are full of your glory. You created us in your own image and redeemed us by your precious blood. By your spirit you sanctified us and called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Grant that we may with thankful hearts receive these great mercies and express our gratitude, not only with our lips, but also in our lives, as we are given to your service and walk before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Deliver us from sin and error, from the frailties of the flesh, the allurements of this present age, and the temptations of the devil. Grant us faith that works in love, hope that never disappoints, kindness that never fails, confidence in you that never wavers, patience that does not grow weary, and courage always ready to confess to you that we may live in your mercy and die in your peace. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, bread and, and forgive us our trespasses. trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with Father and the Holy 